Our topic this evening uh, is part of what we're going to think of as a new series, which we are tentatively calling Biblical Contradictions. It's really trying to say that there are many voices in the Bible, some of which are in conflict with one another, in debate with each other, sometimes in very heated arguments with each other. And we're going to kick this off with two uh, Old Testament books, uh, which I think illustrate the point very clearly and very nicely. The book of Ezra, uh, and also the, little, the littlest book, one of the littlest books anyway in the Old Testament, the book of Ruth, which is nevertheless um, uh, a, an amazing story. It's a story, the book of Ruth is uh, just one clear narrative, and so it's a long narrative, but a short book overall. So I think that um, part of what the whole point of um, our focus on biblical topics in our history theology lectures is to try to kind of highlight where many Christians have a deep misunderstanding of the Bible, what the Bible actually is, and um, uh, essentially how it can be used uh, with greater understanding so that we understand the context, how it came to be, um, and, and how, how it can be re responsibly read and interpreted. And so although the New Testament, if you read, for example, the Gospel of John, um, Christ is said to be the Word of God. So in the beginning is the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That uh, phrase, the Word of God, is refers to Christ, who is the second person of the Trinity, who is God, as Christians normally understand God, or a person of God. Nevertheless, um, it's very, very frequent for Christians, especially evangelicals and fundamentalists, to give that title, the Word of God, maybe even in capitalized like that, to the Bible. So the Bible is the Word of God, which is um, upheld as uh, solely authoritative, uh, uniquely infallible, totally inerrant, and all of these sorts of things. And some of these are creedal statements, and so it's possible, um, I would just say, in the way that we even say that kind of thing in Community of Christ, we would say, um, you know, infallible in its purpose of turning people to God. It's inerrant if used responsibly, but it doesn't mean inerrant or infallible in kind of a literal sense. Because even though people, I think, equate the Bible and read it as if it's a history or a science book that is written with one voice and that is internally consistent, in point of fact, it is a library of religious books that are not history or science books that are speaking in many voices uh, that are, as we're going to see, often debating one another and in some cases directly contradict each other. And so um, if you, we don't have a lot of fundamentalists who watch this channel, which is fine, we don't need to. We're actually having um, people, we have some, and maybe you're in the audience right now in the chat, um, but, but if you are feeling that way, and you're like, no, wait a second, it is totally, there's no contradictions. It's totally, um, every part of the Bible is, uh, doesn't contradict each other. We'll just use an example that's pretty um, inarguable. There are apologetic explanations for this, but they are um, wrong. <laughs> so they're intellectually um, not, uh, not legitimate. So what is the fate, for example, of Judas Iscariot, the apostle who betrayed Jesus? So um, part of the Easter story is that Jesus predicts he'll be betrayed, and he is betrayed by one of his 12 apostles, Judas. And concerning Judas' fate, we read in Matthew's Gospel that when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he, Judas, was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, this is the payment that he had been given to turn uh, Jesus over to them. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. 
Well, what is that to us? They replied, that's your responsibility. So Jesus threw the money into the temple and left, and then he went away and he hanged himself. Now the chief priests picked up the coins and said, it's against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Quote, they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. So Judas in this account in Matthew returns the money, hangs himself, then the priests take the money and they use that to buy a field, which is called a field of blood because um, it was pot bought with blood money, specifically the blood of Jesus, uh, money, the money used to sell out Jesus' blood. By contrast, in the book of Acts, which is written by the same author as who wrote the Gospel of Luke, we read, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled, in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, and his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, the field of blood. So in Luke's version, Judas, not the priests, uses the money to buy a field, and then he dies in that field when he accidentally falls, presumably accidentally anyway, headlong, and his guts spill out, so in other words, not because he's hanged himself someplace other than the field. And in this case, the th field is now called the field of blood because of Judas's blood that is spilled uh, when he falls in it. So although both evangelists here, you know, have a negative fate for Judas, he's going to die. He's going to get his comeuppance in some terrible way. And they also associate Judas. They're aware of an association with Judas in a place in Jerusalem called the Field of Blood. They create two actually contradictory explanations for the association. And this is the same kind of thing that both these two uh, evangelists, the author of Matthew and the author of Luke, we've seen this again and again in a bunch of Scriptures, they are writing about the same time. They have access to some of the same sources. They both have a copy of the Gospel of Mark in front of them. They um, uh, both have access to a list of Jesus' sayings, a collection of Jesus' sayings. Um, and, so the, and then they also have access to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And so they have these ideas like this prophecy in Jeremiah about uh, a field and the 30 pieces of silver and things like that. They have all of these uh, Old Testament things that they are reading and they have these other sources and in some cases they are um, trying to piece together these ideas but when they do it uh, they, they create uh, explanations that sometimes are contradictory and this is an example of a direct contradiction. Um, they've done the same kind of thing when they when they each create a nativity story, where they each create a Christmas story, they know that Jesus is from Nazareth, but they are aware of a messianic prophecy that Jesus, the Messiah should be born in Bethlehem. And so the author of Matthew says that Jesus is from um, Bethlehem, and they have to flee because of Herod, and they later, because of Herod's son, moved to Nazareth, so they weren't from Nazareth. Meanwhile, the uh, author of Luke uh, has the family be from Nazareth and just uh, be visiting Bethlehem uh, because of a census decree, and then they go back home. 
And so it's completely the same problem they want to have, they're trying to solve, and they create contradictory explanations. So um, the Bible has contradictions. And that's because the Bible is a library that speaks with many voices. So we have all of the wide range of Old Testament texts, and included here, this is the Septuagint version, so that also includes all of the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonical texts that are not part of the Protestant and Rabbinic Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, Torah or Hebrew Bible. Uh, and then this is also the canonical New Testament. And of course, we know that beyond the books that made it into these canons, there are all of the uh, pseudepigraphal books that uh, both Old Testament and New and between the Testaments that are like these scriptural books, but are not uh, part of the Bible. So tonight we want to talk about a debate between the book of Ruth and the book of Ezra, which have very diametrically opposed perspectives, even though they're written around the same time, they're responding, maybe one is responding to the other, in fact. So um, these are both uh, from the Old Testament, and they are actually both coming out of, uh, the Septuagint is divided into the law, the books of the law, the books which are the Torah, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the histories, as they're called. They're not real histories, but they um, were understood by ancient peoples as histories, so uh, Joshua the, and so on. We'll look at those. The wisdom books, which includes everything like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and also the Psalms, and then the prophetic books like Isaiah and Jeremiah. So both of these, um, Ruth and uh, Ezra, are coming out of the histories. Um, and so Although these are called histories, like I say, they're not histories in a modern academic sense. They, some of them do include a lot of historical information. So as we've seen, as you get towards the end of Second Kings especially, um, that's getting closer to when that text is written, when there's actual historical memory that is being able to be uh, written into the text, whereas when you're closer to the beginning of that sequence, Joshua and Judges, this is largely legendary account of, uh, in some cases, things that didn't happen. So in terms of Joshua, the, um, the, the conquest and the extermination of the Canaanites that the book of Joshua has um, isn't uh, seemed as a historical event. So um, like I say, others of these though, like the book of Tobit, for example, um, I think everyone views as being entirely literary. It's not a not an actual historical character. It's more like a novel or a romance story, which is kind of a fun romance story. So the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, um, they're separated in a modern Christian Bibles, but they were originally part of one book that um, scholars now call Ezra Nehemiah. At the time, it was just called the book of Ezra uh, in antiquity. If you in almost all modern Christian Bibles, it'll be Ezra and Nehemiah as separate books, but it was one book together. Um, there were two different translations of it that made their way into the Septuagint Greek version. And so um, Ezra and Nehemiah, which we're gonna be considering tonight, is very similar to uh, the Hebrew version that we have. But then there's a second translation that's now known as First Esdras, so Esdras is just the Greek, another Greek way of saying Ezra, but Esdras has a bunch of additions. So it's the same book, but then somehow in the process of uh, making the larger Greek version, there have been additions and the book has been re rearranged and changed a bit. So it's interesting that we have uh, both of those, but anyway, it's two different variants. And um, Esdras is in the canon of um, you know, outside the Protestant canon. So it's apocryphal for the Protestants, but for Orthodox and Catholics, it's part of the Bible. So Ezra and Nehemiah is the last of the histories uh, that make it into the Bible for Protestants. And the rest um, of these from Esdras and Tobit, uh, Tobit and Judith, and the Maccabees and so on are, are 
deuterocanonical for Catholics and Orthodox. They're part of the Bible, but um, not for Protestants. Um, the chronological setting of Ruth is much earlier than Ezra and Nehemiah, and for this reason, it is placed uh, between Judges and 1 Samuel in the books that we call the Deuteronomic histories. So these are essentially Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Samuel, Kings, and Kings, which are essentially one set of histories that it should be read together. And in Christian New Testaments, Ruth is stuck in there in between, even though it's not by the same uh, set of authors and editors as the Deuteronomic histories, because it's set at the time of the Judges, and so these are ordered chronologically. And then finally, out of all of these, we have the two books of Chronicles, which somebody around the time of Ezra, maybe a little later than Ezra, um, uh, and was, um, was writing as a replacement for the Deuteronomic histories. So because the Deuteronomic histories include um, all sorts of embarrassing or negative stories, Chronicles uh, eliminates a lot of those and cleans it all up and makes it more theologically sound for people in the Second Temple period. And um, it's more or less just taking those as a source, rewriting it, uh, and changing essentially the, you know, some cases the moral of the story. And so originally or historically, um, the Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah were thought traditionally to share the same author and be part of the same school, and it's possible that that's the case. In other words, that the uh, if Ezra and Nehemiah is compiled a little later than the historic figure Ezra, it might be part of this chronicler school that is um, also cleaning up the Deuteronomic history. So those are the histories, and we'll look at Ezra, Nehemiah, and Ruth. Um, to just get a um, taste of when they are set, we do this timeline a lot, which takes us from the uh, Bronze Age collapse in the 12th century, uh, all the way down through to the um, control of the Middle East by the great empire of the Persians in the 5th century BC. And so um, after uh, the Bronze Age collapse, uh, when the Philistines, for example, invade Canaan, uh, and the Egyptians are fighting the he Sea Peoples, the Hittite Empire falls, the Mycenaeans and the Minoans fall. Um, in Canaan, this is essentially the, the tribal period, this kind of legendary era of the Judges, and that's the setting for the Book of Judges, stories like Samson and Gideon, and Deborah, and it's also the setting for Ruth. So you can kind of see that. And then also within that era is the um, uh, overlapping time period for when the uh, monarchy under Saul, David, and Solomon is literarily inserted into um, the time period, and then the actual foundings of the Kingdom of Israel, under the Omri dynasty, until its destruction uh, by the Assyrians, and then as the Northern Kingdom becomes a province of the Assyrian Empire, uh, the rise of the Southern Kingdom, Judah, which is at the end of which is when the great uh, Bible writing um, kind of begins. Uh, and so then the fall of Jerusalem, that Babylonian captivity that we talked about that we're going to do a lecture on in a few weeks, then the um, destruction of the Babylonian Empire and conquest by the Persians. Uh, the Persian emperor returns the exiles, and that is what the setting of the book of Ezra. So the setting of Ruth and Ezra are very far apart, but the writing of Ruth and Ezra is um, at, during that Persian period, so at the end of when the setting of Ezra occurs. And so that, um, again, we outline here where the first temple period is and the second temple period as we talk about. 
So let's go to Ezra Nehemiah first. This is the story of the exiles return from Babylon. So uh, the Babylonians, after the destruction of Jerusalem, had taken away uh, the members of the royal family, the Davidic house, and also nobility and upper classes, um, and where they had joined and been a part of the Babylonian court. Uh, they learned Akkadian, and they learned all sorts of uh, Babylonian customs. Um, they ultimately adopted uh, the Babylonian calendar, for example, um, and as part of uh, these empires, uh, well, anyway, they, there was a lot of other, other influence that started happening. Now, um, with the conquest of the Babylonians by the Persians, um, those exiles are allowed by the Persian emperor to, re emperor to return to Judah, which now becomes a minor province, Yehud, this is the Persian way of saying it, within the Persian satrapy of Ibernari. And so the Persian Empire is uh, carved up into large um, kind of semi-autonomous regions ruled by satraps, um, provincial, big provincial sub-kings or administrators. Um, and this is the one that is on the other side, essentially the trans-Euphrates, from the perspective of the Persians. So the Euphrates is a Mesopotamian river, and this is the land on the other side of that. So it's effectively all of Syria, um, Syria, Israel, Palestine, that kind of uh, Lebanon, that kind of territory. So the Levant. The name uh, of the text is for, is for Ezra the scribe and the priest. And that second section of the book Nehemiah is named for a governor, uh, a Jewish-Persian governor. So both of these two are Jewish officials, high courtiers in the Persian court, uh, who um, are sent by the emperor in order to be, in the one case, the priest in, uh, of the Jewish people in Jerusalem, and in the other case, uh, to be the, pro uh, the governor of the province of Yehud. So just to get ourselves our bearings, when we look at um, uh, the ancient Middle East, the Achaemenid Empire, the Persian Empire, um, is the great first great, uh, you know, really great empire in the West. So it overthrows uh, the earlier empires, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, that had been largely um, confined to the Fertile Crescent and Egypt. Uh, and so now uh, they bring into that all of Persia, all of kind of the Caucasus and uh, Anatolia, what's now Turkey, and then ultimately into um, South Asia as well, taking uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, what's now Pakistan and Central Asia. So a very vast empire indeed, and one of the ways um, that the Persian king of kings is able to operate this uh, is unlike uh, the earlier empires like the Assyrians, which were, um, which had this uh, policy of, you know, taking the leaders and, and moving them and forcibly deporting them and moving leaders from the other places around so that you were constantly um, humiliating conquered peoples, uh, destroying their temples, humiliating their gods, and just claiming the superiority of, uh, you know, the gods of Assyria and later the gods of Babylon. Um, the Persians have a relatively tolerant um, policy where uh, people are allowed to practice their own, own customs. They, they, the Persian emperor uh, will support uh, local religions and that policy is very appreciated uh, by the Judeans uh, who in the Bible call Cyrus a messiah uh, or an anointed religious king, in other words, an important um, uh, leader or protector for uh, the faithful. So um, I'm just zooming in here on the Fertile Crescent part, uh, as the Persians have conquered the Neo-Babylonian Empire in 539, um, the exiles are at the capital, what had been the capital in Babylon, Many of them stay, and so the diaspora continues. Um, there are also exiles in Egypt, um, but now 
Uh, Jerusalem, which had been ruined and was still more or less a ruined city, is allowed or they're given permission to rebuild and they're also uh, apparently given funds to rebuild the temple and directions to do so. So the book of Ezra begins with a decree. So it's purportedly issued in 583 BCE by Cyrus, so Cyrus the Great. Um, I think that there's, there's multiple versions of this decree, uh, even in the book of Ezra, and there's also one in the, in the book of Chronicles. Um, it's not clear, where, it's not clear that, the, that any of the text as we have it was what Cyrus would have said, but it does seem to be consistent with the kind of religious policy that Cyrus gives. So this might not be the actual decree. I think a lot of scholars don't think it is, although some argue that it is. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's probably referring to something that is part of Cyrus' general policy. So in the first year of Cyrus, that is the first year of his reign over Babylon, having defeated the Babylonians, Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, to issue a proclamation throughout his entire kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing, which says then, quote, this is apparently supposedly the decree, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So, even though, you may ask, well, wait, wouldn't this does seem like a get giveaway that why would he really be talking about the Lord, the King of Heaven? And it's possible um, because that could be a title that he's giving to the great God uh, of the Persians of the Zoroastrian religion, Ahura Mazda. So that might be, you know, the King of Heaven is one of uh, Ahura Mazda's titles. So those among you who belong to any part of his people, May their God be with him. Let them go up to Jerusalem in Judah to build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, that is, the God who is in Jerusalem. Let all those who have survived in whatever place they may have lived be assisted by the people of that place with silver, gold, goods, and livestock together with the voluntary offerings for the house of God in Jerusalem. So like I say, the historicity of this decree is disputed um, and probably... I don't know, it's hard to say, it's probably not you know, the actual decree, but most scholars agree that Cyrus created a policy of relative tolerance for his subjects' many religions. Um, the returning exiles, according to the book of Ezra, are initially led by a prince of Judah named Sheshbazar. So King Cyrus too had the vessels of the house of the Lord brought forth that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians who had destroyed Jerusalem that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his God. So things that had gone from uh, Jerusalem temple and had been brought as spoils, uh, I presume to Marduk's temple in Babylon. Um, now all those spoils are going to be returned by decree of Cyrus. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought forth by the treasurer Mithridath, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, prince of Judah. All these uh, treasures, they list them all off, Sheshbazar took with him when the exiles were brought up from Babylon to Jerusalem. So who is Sheshbazar? <laughs> the name Sheshbazar may be Akkadian, so it may be Shemesh Abu Usur, which is to say Shemesh, the, the um, Akkadian god of the sun, the Mesopotamian god of the sun, protect the father. If so, then that's really showing, um, you know, in just a couple generations here, a heavy assimilation from the house of David, the royal house, because they're uh, known popularly anyway by Akkadian names that have... Um, you know, a, 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 a theophonic name for, um, you know, a, a Babylonian god. Um, be that as it may, it's hard to know exactly who he is. It's often identified with Shenessar, who is listed in Chronicles as the fourth son of King Jehoiakim of Judah, so um, a king who went into exile in 598. So 
So just one of the sons of the exiled king of the Davidic line. So Sheshbazar here is also mentioned uh, in the book of Ezra in a purported letter from Tatanai, who is the satrap of Ibernari, so that whole big Syrian province that is beyond the Euphrates from Mesopotamia. So Tatanai um, writes to the Persian king Darius I uh, in Ezra chapter 5. And that letter states, quote, A certain Sheshbazar came to Jerusalem and laid the foundations of the house of God, um, but that still decades after he had done that, uh, the satrap is saying the temple still hadn't been completed. So that's uh, the mentions that we have of Sheshbazar in the book of Ezra. Whoever uh, he might have been, he immediately falls out of the story in the book of Ezra. Um, and so he is now replaced by a second Davidic prince, Zerubbabel. Um, so he now is the, listed as the governor of Yehud, the Persian province, little Persian province around Jerusalem. And he is the one who is said to be in charge of the construction of the temple. So Zerubbabel is also a Davidic prince. He is the grandson of Jeconiah, who is the second to last king of Judah prior to the exile. And so it's possible, depending on who exactly Sheshbazar is, that he is a nephew uh, of the previous prince governor. Like Sheshbazar, though, Zerubbabel has an Akkadian name, which means Seed of Babylon. And so again, it's showing um, the remarkable assimilation in the two-for-two two names we have here of the Judean princes um, uh, taking Babylonian names uh, as they are part of the Babylonian court. So of Zerubbabel, who becomes the governor of Yehud, the book of Ezra says, Then the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, son of Iddo, began to prophesy to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel. Thereupon Zerubbabel, son of Shealtel, and Jeshua, son of Zozazak, Josadak <laughs> began again to build the house of God in Jerusalem with the prophets of God giving them support. So as the text here illustrates, you know, Zerubbabel's importance at the time is also shown by multiple references to him by contemporary prophets. So minor prophets Haggai and Zechariah, who are active around this time, uh, talk about Zerubbabel. Haggai, for example, in 520 BCE, um, says the word of the Lord came to him and told him to, quote, speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, quote, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. On that day, Oracle of the Lord of hosts, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Oracle of the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, Oracle of the Lord of hosts. So Zerubbabel here is going to, after this apocalyptic moment when uh, the kingdoms of the world, presumably the, the Persians and all of the people that they are uh, king of kings over, uh, are overthrown, then there will be a um, uh, Zerubbabel who is uh, a chosen of the Lord will be like the Lord's signet ring. So it doesn't say, you know, you'll have an independent or a restored kingdom, um, but there is certainly eagerness here that the Davidic line um, has now returned to uh, the place where the kingdom was. So you now have the Davidic kings, um, ruling as governors anyway, though, over, over Jerusalem, and maybe, maybe, maybe it's intending here, or the hope is that there will be a client kingdom within the Persian Empire or some subsequent world empire, um, or maybe there's even a greater hope. So as work uh, begins to take shape on the temple, 
And as uh, the various sacrifices and some of the festivals are restored, Judah's neighbors uh, respond with an offer to help. So again, we read in uh, the book of Ezra, chapter 4, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin, which is to say the, the two southern tribes who, you know, the southern tribe of Judah and the half tribe of Benjamin that are returning from uh, their leader's return is among the exiles, when, uh, when the enemies of those tribes heard that the exiles, the returning exiles, were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the ancestral houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God just as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. So, we're talking here uh, probably about, I mean, almost certainly about the Samaritans. And so, um, uh, this is the uh, provinces as it had been um, created by the Assyrians, and the Assyrian provinces were passed ultimately to the Babylonians, and then now to the Persians. This is all within this, uh, it would have new administrative boundaries, I'm sure, but within this uh, satrapy of the land beyond the Euphrates. So although these neighbors indicate here that they believe that, I mean, they believe and they worship the same God as the returning exiles, the book of Ezra has a highly partisan response. So right out the bat, out of the gate, um, the author calls them the enemies of Judah and Benjamin, and also puts into their mouths the idea that they are people that they are people that are living in the land who are not true Israelites, but are rather are foreigners settled in Israel by the Assyrian king Esarhaddon after Samaria had become a province of the Assyrian Empire in 722 BC. Um, this is probably not something that any of these guys would have said. This is a as something that you're putting in their mouths because you were, you were making that argument against them. Um, rather, uh, the people in the north would have considered themselves to be true Israelites, who maybe, yes, some people had been brought there in the same way some of their nobles had been taken away to Assyria and lost. Uh, nevertheless, um, they considered themselves to continue to be worshipers of the God of Israel. So, um, in any event, uh, wh whatever they fought, we only have the um, Ezra's kind of partisan anti-Samaritan uh, version of the story. The returning exiles rebuffed uh, this offer to help build the temple. Zerubbabel, we read, Jeshua and the rest of the ancestral houses of Israel, the returning exiles, answered them, It is not your responsibility to build with us a house for our God, but we alone must build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as Cyrus, king of Persia, has commanded us. And so after um, being rebuffed, if the offer had been genuine, it's now uh, turned to enmity. And so from this point um, onward through history, the Samaritans and the Judeans are going to be enemies. So... Zerubbabel is able to complete the temple, or his people do, whether he's there to do it or not. Um, um, the Samaritans actively hinder uh, the work, as do other neighbors, so they're constantly uh, writing to the government and complaining uh, about, uh, about you know, these rebellious Judeans and building their temple and all these kinds of things. So it took over 20 years to construct what was a relatively modest structure um, very modest in comparison to Herod's later rebuilding of the Second Temple with its massive uh, platform, and this is just the little central area, uh, and even this building would have been much smaller than what, what Herod ended up building. So, according to Ezra chapter 6, they completed this house on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius of Persia, that is, uh, in 515 BCE. The Israelites, the priests, Levites, and the other returned exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. 
However, um, when we get to this finishing of the temple, Zerubbabel is not explicitly mentioned as still being there uh, as the governor. And despite all of the importance that he had, including uh, the prophetic expectations uh, of Haggai and other prophets, um, he falls out of the story entirely without any explanation, so he just disappears. Um, and it's only afterwards he's kind of referred to in the book of Nehemiah retrospectively. You know, in the days of uh, Zerubbabel, this sort of thing got started. So what happens now to the house of David? So um, it uh, isn't, isn't actually clear. So instead, um, uh, Nehemiah is appointed governor of Yehud in the book of Nehemiah. So it may be that the revolutionary expectations, you know, kind of illustrated by these prophetic attention, um, that all of that kind of uh, expectations that a uh, Davidic prince had, you know, that might have been just seemed as way too dangerous by the Persian court. Certainly, according to the book of Ezra, they're getting a lot of nasty letters to that effect from the Samaritans and other, other neighbors. Uh, and so maybe it's decided that um, that they recall Zerubbabel and other Davidic princes to back to Persia, and that's uh, where the, the dynasty gets suppressed, and we never hear from it again. So for whatever reason, the house of David, which had been the focus of the Old Covenant, and so much prophetic expectations, so much of the biblical text to this date, now silently falls out of the record. Instead, as I say, Nehemiah, who is a important uh, Jewish official at the Persian court, a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, um, convinces Artaxerxes to appoint him governor of Yehud maybe in the year 445. So Nehemiah is given permission to rebuild walls around Jerusalem. So uh, the temple is restored, now the city is restored. Uh, nevertheless, the city is much smaller um, uh, than it had been, and, and certainly much smaller than it's going to be. So, um, as you can kind of see, a, a, the smaller temple complex, and then the walls go around the what had been the, the old city of David. Um, the old city as we now know it today expands a lot to the uh, north and, and west of this, a much bigger uh, walls that encompass it than in, in Nehemiah's time. So despite the occasional support from Persian kings as described in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, Jerusalem in this area, era was still kind of a smallish uh, provincial subcapital of, you know, again, a poor, relatively unimportant region within this great, great empire of Persia. So we've talked about all of these governors. Uh, what about Ezra? So in addition to the provincial governors, the Persian kings also began appointing high priests. So Artaxerxes, uh, king of Persia, commissions Ezra, who is called both a scribe and a priest. Um, Ezra, in the book of Ezra anyway, claims descent from the high priest Aaron, the brother of Moses, and down through Aaron's uh, descendants, down through Zadok, who is the high priest at the time of King David, and then uh, all the way thence down to Ezra uh, in the begats list here. <laughs> um, and it also says that Ezra had been one of the exiles in Babylon, uh, specifically one who had set his heart on the study and practice of the law of the Lord. So he is an expert in uh, the law and Torah. Um, I'll just mention that this, uh, this list, though, of, of Ezra's ancestry that's provided, um, certainly from Zadok to Ezra, it is far too a uh, few generations. Um, these priests would have to be living way longer amounts of time in order to, you know, there's so many generations between David um, and uh, the Davidic prince like Zerubbabel, just, you know, many, 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 many more greats that go in between here than this. So it is a um, created genealogy, but it doesn't have enough, uh, doesn't have enough names. Um, Nehemiah describes Ezra publicly reading the Torah to the whole assembly in Jerusalem, all the men, women, and the children, 
And so we sa it, it says, in the square in front of the water gate, Ezra read out of the book from daylight till daybreak till midday in the presence of the men, the women, and those children old enough to understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. He opened the scroll so that all the people might see it, for he was standing higher than any of the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people, their hands raised high, answered, Amen, Amen. So in reading the law publicly, the people are reminded of many things, including a commandment to observe the festival of the booths by building and dwelling in booths. And so in response to hearing that, the entire assembly of the returned exiles made booths and dwelt in them. Now the Israelites had done nothing of this sort from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until this occasion. Therefore, there was very great joy. Ezra read from the book of the law of God day after day, from the first day to the last, they kept the feast for seven days and the solemn assembly on the eighth day, as was required. So, so many scholars have said that this occasion described here um, may be the moment that Ezra and his scribes are first reading the Torah, compiled and edited together in close to its present format for the first time. So this may be the first time anybody's had um, the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, as we sort of have them. And that's one of the reasons why when Ezra's reading it, um, they find things in the law that they'd never heard of before and nobody'd actually obeyed for uh, in, since legendary times, since Joshua. So it's also suggested that maybe it's Ezra and his scribes, um, and maybe back at the P Persian court in Babylon, um, that they had been the ones that have actually edited all of the source text together in the compilation that now becomes the Torah. So whether or not it can be attributed to Ezra, um, what we can say is that the five books of Moses are probably taking shape um, in this earlier Persian part of the Second Temple period. And one of the reasons for that is that so many of the themes that are included, like the Exodus story, have such obvious appeal to the returning exiles. So in the same way that uh, um, the tribes of Israel had been in exile, in slavery in Egypt, and are delivered and are able to come and to the Promised Land and ultimately build a temple, that narrative has been relived now uh, by the exiles returning from Babylon. And so it could be that there were lots and other, lots of other um, writings uh, in a cycle of, um, of religious stories that the exiles had, uh, some of which didn't make the cut because they weren't as um, appealing to them. In any event, that's, we don't have it, so that's an argument that's made. So acting as the chief priest, Ezra sets the tone now for religious observance in Jerusalem. So um, one of these things um, that we have is, let me see if I missed one here. So uh, the, yeah, the slides are out of order. So, so observing the festival of booths is not the only commandment that Ezra found in the law. So in Nehemiah 13, we read, at that time, when the book of Moses was being read in the hearing of the people, it was found written there, no Ammonite or Moabite may ever be entered, admitted into the assembly of God. And when they heard that law, they separated all of those of mixed descent from Israel. So that reading that they're doing when Ezra's reading the law, that's coming from the book of Deuteronomy, so from the Torah, uh, uh, chapter 23, verse 4, which reads, no Ammonite or Moabite may ever come into the assembly of the Lord, nor may any of their descendants, even to the 10th generation, come into the assembly of the Lord. So this rule um, has very serious effects as Ezra's very first order of business was to review everybody's ethnic bloodlines in the province here. So the leaders approached me, this is written in first person from Ezra's 
point of view, approached me with this report. Neither the Israelite laymen, nor the priests, nor the Levites have kept themselves separate from the peoples of the land and their abominations. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves. And their sons, thus intermingling the holy seed with the seeds of the peoples of the lands. Furthermore, the leaders and the rulers have taken a prominent part in this apostasy. So Ezra is shocked by that report that's presented to him. And when he, I had heard this, he said, I tore my cloak and my mantle. I plucked the hair from my head and my beard. I sat there devastated. He gives this long prayer of shame and humiliation of guilt at this direct disobedience of the law of Moses. Um, and so ultimately they find a solution. The leaders confess their sins and determine that the only hope for uh, the people of Judah remains, as one of them suggests, quote, we have indeed betrayed our God by taking as wives foreign women of the peoples of the land. Yet in spite of this, there is still hope remains for Israel. Let us therefore enter into a covenant before our God to dismiss all our foreign wives and the children born of them, in keeping with what you, my Lord, advise, and those who are in dread of the commandments of our God. Let it be done according to the law. So their solution is they're going to abandon all of their wives and uh, disown all of their children. So Ezra chapter 10 then gives a long list of all of the transgressors, all of the men who had taken foreign wives and sired children. And at the end of that list, it is noted, all these had taken foreign wives, but they sent them away, both the children, and, both the women and their children. So um, problem solved. <laughs> Casting aside these women and children may have pleased Ezra, but it's clear that not everyone in Yehud agreed. Another Jewish scribe, also writing during the Persian portion of the Second Temple period, so sometime in the you know, 6th through 4th centuries BCE, wrote a biblical story with a moral that uh, opposes Ezra's and also has an opposite def and, uh, interpretation and creates a precedent for the law to be interpreted differently. So, um, this book, the book of Ruth, is set in the time of Judges, so very much earlier. So, according to the Bible, prior to the reign of the kings, the Israelites were divided into tribes that are led by judges, as we tend to translate it into the... Um, English Bible might just as easily say chieftains, so people that are um, rulers of clans that are religious in character, but also you know sort of less than kings, also military leaders too. So the book of Ruth is explicitly set in the time of Judges, and thus, as we saw, it's placed between the book of Judges and 1 Samuel in the Christian Old Testament. So if we zoom in, on the area of Judah. You can see it kind of the north of Judah in the tribal time period is Bethlehem. Jerusalem is part of the Jebusite land at this time. And Moab is across the Dead Sea. So the book of Ruth begins, once back in the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem of Judah left home with his wife and two sons to reside on the plateau of Moab. The man was named Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and his sons Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah. So they're a sub a clan of Ephrathites uh, among the Judahites. Sometime after their arrival on the, plain, um, on the plateau of Moab, Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion died also, and the woman was left with neither her two boys nor her husband. So um, if we remember from all of our readings of, uh, especially Genesis, but uh, the, whole, the whole Pentateuch, 
Uh, one of the voices within the Torah is the Yahwist voice, um, who especially likes uh, puns and likes to create folk etymologies for um, everybody's names. So the author of Ruth has a similar fondness for puns. So the family's home is Bethlehem, which sounds in Hebrew like house of bread. But of course, there's an irony that they're facing a famine there and have to leave the house of bread to go to Moab. Um, the Hebrew meaning of the names of all of the family members is similarly telling. So Naomi's name means pleasant or sweet. Elimelech uh, means my God is king. But their sons, Chilion and Malon, mean wasting away and sickness. So, um, you know, they don't have any part in the story. They die off in the first few verses of it. And, and so it's, it's sort of a key here that to kind of say this is really a parable as opposed to, um, you know, a historical, um, even meant to be historical uh, text. Um, Chilion marries Orpah, whose name means stiff next. And Malon marries Ruth, whose name means companion, which is a presaging uh, her role in this story. So in the first three verses, obviously, um, we've lost the husband and the two sons. And so for Naomi, um, all that remains are her Moabite daughters-in-law um, that she's only sort of even tenuously related to since the direct connections in both cases have um, passed away. And so when the news comes that the famine back in Bethlehem has ended, Naomi plans to leave Moab and return home. And so she's on the road, we read, back to the land of Judah. Naomi says to her daughters-in-law, you know, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord show you the same kindness as you have shown to the deceased and to me. May the Lord guide each of you to find a husband and a home in which you will be at rest. So you, um, you're both young. I don't have uh, pretty much more or less saying you, I can't, I'm too old to bear new sons. I have no other sons for you to marry. Um, and so there's no point for you to be with me. Either one of you, you go back to your own people and there will be, uh, you can, you're still young widows and you can remarry and have a great life. Um, both of the daughters-in-law protest, uh, but after that kind of argument by uh, Naomi, Orpah goes ahead and says, okay, well, you've made, you've made the case. Uh, goodbye, mother-in-law. I'm going to go back to my own family. Um, uh, she's convinced and returns to her mother, but Ruth absolutely refuses to leave, leave her mother-in-law. So she says, you know, don't press me to go back and abandon you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there be buried. May the Lord do thus to me and more, if even death separates me from you. So, you know, with this pledge of devotion, Naomi stops arguing with Ruth. She realizes that uh, it's not going to have any more effect, and so they decide to go together to Bethlehem. Um, upon their arrival in Bethlehem, the whole town we read is excited about them, and the women ask, can this be Naomi? Uh, but Naomi says back to them, don't call me Naomi, you know, which means pleasant or sweet, call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. So they, uh, Naomi and her Moabite daughter-in-law Ruth arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So without husbands and sons, the two widows um, are like all ancient people in a very potentially desperate circumstance. But uh, in this story, they're shown to be hardworking and wise, and they're able to find a way forward through um, diligence and planning. They also make use of Mosaic law. So the author of Ruth is very well versed in the Torah, which uh, the character Naomi employs to improve her circumstances and Ruth's. 
So Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech, has a rich kinsman named Boaz. Uh, and Boaz, because he's righteous, leaves grain that has been dropped on the ground during harvest. He lets it lie where it falls because of that is a Levitical commandment to do so. Uh, and then according to custom, um, women can come and glean there afterwards, which means take up the, the leftovers. So as Ruth is gleaning in Boaz's fields, she catches his attention and he starts giving her preferential treatment. Um, the situation provides Naomi with a potential plan uh, as she sets out to tell her daughter-in-law she wants to help her find, uh, place her in a pleasing home. So Naomi says to Ruth, now, is not Boaz, whose uh, young women you were working with, a relative of ours? This very night, he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now, go and bathe and anoint yourself and put on your best attire and go down to the threshing floor. Do not make yourself known to the man before he has finished eating and drinking, but when he lies down, take note of the place where he lies then go uncover a place at his feet, and you lie down, and he will tell you uh, then what to do. And so uh, feet here is generally interpreted as a euphemism, so this is kind of the plan to uh, seduce Boaz. The plan to sleep with Boaz works, which ultimately leads him to marry Ruth, again by a clever twist in the law. So lever it marriage uh, in the law of Moses obliged a brother of a deceased man to marry his brother's widow in order to provide the deceased man with heirs. So um, he raises up children who are then said to be his brother's uh, sons. So although Boaz is not the brother of Ruth's deceased husband, Malon, nor of Naomi's husband, Elimelech, um, they assemble a council of elders in Bethlehem, and during that, Boaz assumes uh, responsibilities for the women as their nearest kinsmen, or by claiming it. So there's even a, a closer kinsman who uh, decides not to take a, anybody up on the offer so that it falls to Boaz, and thus, uh, through this kind of clever play on the law, Boaz inherits uh, their property, and he marries Ruth. Ruth's children are then seen as heirs for Naomi. So Boaz took Ruth. When they came together as husband and wife, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not failed to provide you today with a Redeemer. May he become famous in Israel. He will restore your life and be the support of your old age, for his mother is the daughter-in-law who loves you. She is worth more to you than seven sons. So Naomi took the boy, cradled him against her breast, and cared for him. Then the neighbor women joined in the celebration, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So they live happily ever after, and Ruth has this then legacy. Ruth, Boaz's son by Ruth, the Moabitess, is Obed, whose son is Jesse, whose son is none other than King David himself, the uh, eponymous ancestor of the uh, Davidic uh, dynasty, the house of David, uh, and the model, the model of kingship for you know, biblically. And so, he is obviously part of the congregation, the assembly of the Lord, despite what the law of Moses has written in Deuteronomy 23.4. So no Ammonite or Moabite may ever come into the assembly of the Lord, nor may any of their descendants, even to the 10th generation, come to the assembly of the Lord. So this is whatever that is, one, two, three generations to get to King David. So the anonymous author of Ruth, like Ezra, was well-versed in Mosaic law. It's very familiar with the storytelling uh, found in the Torah and also the Deuteronomic histories. 
like the book of Judges, the story of Ruth creates the ultimate precedent, David himself, for the Moabites and their descendants, that they should be welcomed into the congregation, into the assembly of the Lord, which I think is directly challenging Ezra's interpretation described in the book of Ezra. So Ezra and the author of Ruth both knew and treasured the law, but they had different perspectives about how it should be lived, which is why I think that this tonight, anyway, I wanted to outline as a beautiful example of a debate within the Bible. So Ezra insisted on exclusion, even if it meant making enemies of neighbors, the Samaritans, who were enemies then forever, destroying families and impoverishing children. The author of Ruth saw things very differently indeed. Um, you know, as we talk a little bit about this, I just want to take a, as an aside, talk about identity uh, and boundary maintenance. When we are going to make a group like the exiles are doing when they're returning home, um, that group is, is us. How do we define us? Well, one of the ways is that we draw a circle around us and we look at all the people that aren't us and we call them them. And in order for, um, in order for that circle to be defined, we have to create a boundary. We have to say what it is. So Ezra um, has a way of saying that, uh, which is that there, it, it, uh, the people cannot be Moabites and so on. Um, the reality of group identity is that there's a big diversity within uh, the group that is us, and there is a big diversity in the group that's them, and the, big, the difference between the two is actually the one is on the one side of the border and the one is on the other side of the border. But when we have a strong um, identity and border sense, what we can sometimes happen is we see all of them as being the same, one big monolithic group uh, that opposes us. And sometimes the force uh, can become very strong, a, a, a group identity can be very strong, which uh, causes incredible conformity uh, among the in-group as well. Um, and this can cause all kinds of injustice when um, people who are, are a little bit different from whatever the main line of us is uh, face a lot of repression and persecution. Nevertheless, the stronger this border is, the stronger the powers of conformity are, the stronger the, um, the demonization of the other on the outside, the stronger the group identity. So then it re- becomes very, very strong. And so you know, what Ezra did, you know, may well have created a very powerful group identity that um, other, other groups that w- were contemporary uh, didn't have, and so they have ceased to exist uh, for one reason or another. So Ezra's rules were, um, Moabites are them, <laughs> and there is no entry for ten generations, and if there has been an intermarrying, that's too bad. We have to uh, cast uh, those women off and uh, abandon those children and, not, and not consider them to be our children anymore. Um, and, and in some ways, this is also how um, the Israelite identity even um, in, actually is formed in a lot of other different ways. So at the actual time of the judges historically, all of the different Canaanite, Israelite, Judahite peoples are, are largely um, you know, similar to each other. There is not a, uh, the Israel, Judah is not actually totally alien from their neighbors. They all have the same kind of customs. They all speak the same languages. And there's very little difference between um, Paleo-Hebrew and Phoenician. All of these are, um, are interconnected to each other, even the Philistines who had originally been separate um, sea people conquerors, they had ultimately been assimilated by the larger population and spoken you know, kind of the same language and had the same basic religion and so on. But the formation of Israelite identity by deciding this is, these are the people of Israel and establishing, for example, a national uh, uh, myth of where we all came from and how we are all different from everybody around us is one of the reasons why um, you, you know Israel came into existence. Uh, and so 
this is how we do this. We have groups. We create, you know, us versus them, and then, then after a certain amount of time, then there is, a, there is becomes a big historic separation once once that identity has been created. And so, um, I think that's another story of uh, of the um, of this dialogue between Ruth and Ezra. Uh, because in some ways, ways I'm, my natural inclination is to be very in favor of Ruth. On the other hand, uh, for you to have a group, some boundary maintenance is necessary. You do have to have um, something that is separating your group from not your group. Because if you don't, you lack any identity and cohesion, and your group doesn't, doesn't really exist or it ceases to exist. So that's the, other, the flip side of the human nature here. And so that is my uh, take on the dialogue between uh, Ruth and Ezra. And so I'm going to get a drink of water, and Landro is going to look at your questions, and <laughs> we'll see what people have to say. So first off, I want to thank people who've been um, supporting us. Uh, Dave Anderson, Mark Long. Daryl Scott, who also says, happy birthday to me. Thank you, unrecognized talent. Also saying, get me some cake. <laughs> so yeah, I spent my birthday researching uh, a lecture for you guys and doing the lecture. So th that's something I enjoy doing and uh, I appreciate it. Uh, James Sweeney, also thank you for your support. J, um, sorry, L, L. Young and um, JM. Um, scroll a little bit, Leandro. I want to thank some of our PayPal and Canada Helps uh, donors as well. So Ian Fraser, Elise Wood, uh, Galen DaCosta, Noah Henninger, uh, Charles Reynolds, Keith Martz, Gregory Lund, uh, Ariel Umberto, uh, Tiara Molina, uh, Lindsay Gardner, Windsor, uh, Windsor Dairy, Deborah Moore, John Klinkner, and the, it's going. <laughs> wow, there's a lot. David Ostefan, uh, Reagan Harrington, Le uh, Leonard Byrne, Tho Tran, uh, Nelson uh, Decato, and Eric Nordquist. Thank you so much, everybody. We, you're making this hat possible. Um, James Sweeney said, uh, Why did the Jewish people seem to prosper so uniquely in the Persian period, both in cultural unification and the literary revival seems to have been particularly prosperous time. So I, I think that, um, you know, from what we can kind of see, the, uh, the Jewish people are, ver are, are very much more connected to the Persians and get along very well with the Persians than they do, uh, than they tend to, I think, with the, the Greek leaders and the Roman leaders. Uh, and so, uh, in all of these literary sources, there are high Jewish officials as, as courtiers who are hanging around in the Persian court. So they, they seem to be compatible. They have had, um, it was probably very um, fortuitous that they had been part of the Babylonian court at a, at a certain moment when um, the Babylonian court is, is sort of sucked up into the Persian court and uh, Jewish people were brought along with it. And, um, and so, yeah, then there's a, um, because of interest in, in reviving uh, the temple, uh, it does seem like there's a, um, you know, a direct permission structure that is coming from the court to allow some of these courtiers to go ahead and lead that. So it does seem like um, this is a time period where they are, are well connected to each other. Um, you know, part of the thing that happens in the, in the second part of the tech, Second Temple period with the Hellenistic times is um, because there is a, uh, there are two, two powers here. The, the Seleucids are in Mesopotamia and Syria, and the Ptolemies are in Egypt. Um, uh, Judea becomes a, a, a frontier between them. And so I think that they were doing all right in the, in the Hellenistic period too. But, but then it becomes a kind of a frontier between them and there's some, some fighting that happens between those two centers, which is a little bit of a problem. But of course, then as the Hellenistic kingdoms deteriorate, it gives them uh, also a unique moment to, to actually have their own little Hellenistic uh, kingdom for a, 
uh, a very brief period of time before the Romans take over everything. Um, Kaiwan uh, says, what was so special about 10 generations? Why not six or 12? Um, so I don't know particularly why that particular um, time frame is given in Deuteronomy, why it wouldn't be six or 12, why it was, why it was 10. I mean, it's 10 generations is essentially forever. Um, and so it's pretty much saying forever. <laughs> so um, Daryl Scott says, uh, did the people who put the Septuagint together realize that these books were in conflict? Did they think about it back then? Um, I don't know if they, I don't know if I've read a commentary, you know, from, from this time period where they're seeing it as being in conflict. I think that um, they, they probably did. The, the, the thing about, um, the, the thing about uh, Second Temple Jewish and then especially now rabbinic Judaism, Jewish study is, is understanding that these texts, you are in dialogue with these texts and that ends up being the whole point of what the rabbis do. So uh, once you have you know, the Hebrew Bible, the, the dialogue doesn't stop because the Talmud and, and the Mishnah and everything, this continues to be additional rabbinic um, dialogue where you have the, like, the text here and then there's commentary, commentary, you know, all surrounding it. So, so there is um, argumentation is kind of part of the idea. Um, what we're kind of trying to, so I don't think that it's the idea of dialogue and conflict within the scriptures is lost, especially among Jews. It's just amongst, I think, some Christians where um, there's just this idea that the Bible is written in King James English in one voice that just, and it drops out of heaven on people and they can take one little verse out of it and, and apply it to anything because, uh, because they're not... Um, they're not aware of the broader dialogue. So I, I would say that, yeah, it probably was understood at different times, certainly maybe even at the time, um, if you were somebody who was not getting rid of your um, Moabite wife and your children and you were being discriminated against um, uh, culturally in Jerusalem at the time. Um, if, you had, um, if you had a copy of the Book of Ruth, that might be... Uh, something that consoled you and and your family, uh, you would see that as different from, you know, the what the priest was saying. Uh, Unrecognized talent says, uh, how many people lived in Jerusalem before the destruction of the first temple, roughly speaking? Um, so, so I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that. We'd have to look up what the what the estimates are. So it's not it's not huge even then. Um, it's never been a super huge city. Uh, it is, but it uh, would have been bigger, I think, at the end of the first temple period, and then bigger again at the end of the second temple period. Um, but small, smaller at the kind of beginning of the second temple period. Uh, it's only the whole circuit of the walls, uh, um, by the time Nehemiah uh, builds them or rebuilds them, is about a, a mile and a half or something. So very, very small circumference city. Um, Stephanie Ceresi asks, does John consider all of this to be real history or any of it? So, so the Ruth story is not real history. Um, it's a parable that's written many, many, many centuries later. It's a wonderful story, but it's not real history. The Ezra um, story, I think, is mostly, I would say it's probably mostly real history. It may not be exactly as, as stated, um, but I think that, that that's written fairly close to, you know, within a, if not by Ezra himself, there's a part that's written in, in first person, which maybe is written by Ezra, maybe is not, but it may be written within you know, a few generations or so after when Ezra would be. Um, so, um, uh, so I would say yes, the, that a bunch of Ezra, that a bunch of the stuff we read in Ezra is, is historical. Um, so, uh, When did, 322 Messenger says, when did Jesus throw the tables over in the synagogue? Did this take place uh, in the Easter week, Palm Sunday to Monday, Thursday? So, so it's uh, the money, the tables of the money changers is not in the synagogue, it's in the temple complex in Jerusalem. Uh, and so 
it's uh, at the yes, it's like you saying it's the story is set uh, right before the first Easter in the Gospels. Um, in the Synoptic Gospels, it's set then, and so that's right in the last week of Jesus' life, and so uh, it would be on you know in the in the days leading up to the first Easter. It doesn't say uh, which day it happened uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, um, but it would have been in the days leading up to it. And so some people have argued, some historians have argued that this disruption that Jesus makes in the temple is one of the things that uh, caught the attention of Roman authorities who ultimately executed him. Another, uh, it's set in the Synoptic Gospels after the, the Palm Sunday event where Jesus is uh, imitating and satirizing a uh, Roman military triumph, which uh, also caught the attention because the crowds are, are following him around. So that would have caught the attention of the Roman authorities. And so um, they are potentially, according to the Synoptic Gospels anyway, seeing him as a revolutionary and he's charged with insurrection and making himself be the king of the Jews. Uh, and he's executed for that cause in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, in terms of uh, the Gospel of John, um, I think the money changer, the temple incident takes place um, much earlier. And so this is an example of, again, the, the, the Gospels themselves, the biblical authors not agreeing with each other. So, um, so we can't know, but that's what uh, we just can take from those, um, from those Gospel accounts, which is the only accounts we have of that. Christian Skaggs says, um, what are some of the apologetic rebuttals to the whole field of blood contradiction you discussed in your introduction. So, so, what, so it doesn't really work to have an apologetic rebuttal, but essentially what, what people will say is um, that when it says that, uh, that um, Judas fell and his gut spilled out, that is just another way of saying, or another word for saying that he was hanged. So it doesn't. So people will try to argue that that's not inconsistent with saying that you hang yourself. Um, the the part though about where you know, like Judas actually buys the field as opposed to him throwing away the the money and then the priests buying the field. That's a direct contradiction. So I don't know. I, I feel like um, it's diff they you know they you have to admit at some point or other that there's a direct contradiction. <laughs> so. Um, but I've heard it. I've heard people try to harmonize the two by saying that um, that him saying that he f fell over and and his guts spilled out is could still be a description of hanging, which I don't think it is. Um, Adam Euchre says, uh, "Are there any connections between the books of Ruth and the book of uh, of Esther?" Um, I don't think so, except for the fact that they're. Um, that they're from the the Persian period, and so Esther is talking about, um, you know, is is set again in the in the Persian period and with the Persian court, and so we, it'll be interesting to um, explore some of that the text of Esther at some point or other, and some of these other texts that are related to the or from that same era, this era in the um, Persian period. Um, Paul Cleve says. Uh, was Naomi a bit devious when it came to getting Ruth married? I think so. <laughs> I think that that was she was being clever. Um, she, she, she said, uh, you know, when she, when it became apparent that her, I mean, she sent first off uh, Ruth to um, her kinsmen's uh, fields as opposed to some anybody else's fields, and then when it was apparent that she, that Ruth had caught his attention. You know, she she has a, this plan, which is pretty um, intentional, which is bathe, get anointed, wear your best clothes, wait till the guy gets drunk <laughs> and, and falls asleep, uh, and then when he when he does, you know, you know, lie with him, um, you know, that that does seem like a a pretty intentional uh, plan, and she also announces what her goal is with that, which is I want to. Get you put into a, a comfortable house so that you could be. You know, he, she wants her, her to be able to get married and 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 have a have a good life. So it does seem like um, you know that's an intentional pl plot. Can we scroll up later? So we just did Paul Cleves. Um, 
Stephanie Ceresi asks, um, where in the timeline did the Jewish temple on Elephantine Island uh, in the Nile exist concurrently? So it would be, oh, I guess we are we're probably seeing the timeline right now. I don't see, I'm not seeing it on the thing, but essentially it's in the, um, it's in the second temple period. And so what happens is that um, uh, we see it, in the, you can see down there at the end of the kingdom of Judah when it falls um, and it says Jeremiah is active. So Jeremiah escapes, the prophet Jeremiah escapes with um, a part of the Judahite army and they go to Egypt. And so one of the things that the Egyptian uh, Pharaoh does is, um, so again, you don't resettle Judeans on your border with Judea, what you do is you put them on the other side of your frontier, and so he has them um, uh, defending uh, against southern borders. And so then they establish a, um, uh, like you say, they have a, a colony and a, and a temple that's established on Elephantine Island, and that continues to exist in the Second Temple period down through um, down through kind of Hellenistic times, because there are there is communication uh, from the from the temple in Egypt to the to the uh, people in Judea. So, uh, Miguel Angel says, "Oh, what? oh, so at his feet was a euphemism. So that's um, so yeah, uncover his feet." <laughs> And sleep at his feet is generally interpreted as a euphemism. <laughs> so, so, but you know, it says at his feet. But I, so I, I, I let you I lead you to um, leave it to your imagination. <laughs> you know what that's a euphemism for. <laughs> so Michelangelo says, um, how possible is it that Ruth was written by a woman? Has any scholar proposed that theory? It reminded me about Luke in that sense. Um, so it's, I think it's possible, again, I don't know. The problem is that the, um, so it's earlier. So the, the, the thing about for, for Luke is that we're getting to, um, I don't know, you're get, we're getting to later, as you get later, there's more people who have literacy and more people that are rich uh, in, a, in an empire, but it's completely still possible. Um, at this earlier time, it's just we don't have a huge number of examples. But um, but in the same way that uh, that people have made the case that the that the Yahwist author um, in in the in the Pentateuch is a Judean princess, so that's a case that Harold Bloom has made uh, among others. I think it's completely possible that you could. And this is an anonymous author. It's an anonymous author who. Um, is focusing on women and women's issues. Um, so is it possible that there's a um, illiterate noble woman um, who, who has composed this or who has been the patron of the text? Yeah, it's, it's, I think, possible. I, don't, I haven't heard the argument made in the case of Ruth, but I, do, I agree with you that this reminds me a lot of the Yahweh source and it reminds me a lot of Luke. And so this is maybe one of the reasons why I like Ruth so much. So whether it's a written by a, a, a male scribe who is simply more empathetic and realizes that women are people, or whether it's uh, written because uh, a scribe has uh, a female patron who is interested in stories like this, or whether there may actually be a wealthy literate woman who has uh, been able to compose the text, um, that we can't know, I think. Uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for your support. So unless there's more questions, which there are not, I will just say in closing, don't forget to like and share this video, subscribe to our channel. If you're able, please consider a donation at centerplace.ca slash donate. And next week, I'm trying to remember what it is, it is Constantinople and the Fourth Crusade. That's going to be a fun one. See you then.